When I was working for equality in the church, for women bishops as well, I had a shocking moment. I was in the chapel of Edward the Confessor in Westminster Abbey, and I knelt down to do an old-fashioned prayer, evoking angels and archangels, as you would in a place like that. It's so old. And I saw that in my deep imagination, all the angels were masculine. And when I prayed further, I realized I was in danger of kind of losing my relationship with God because I was praying to Father and Son. And I had to ask myself, what would it be if I took Julian of Norwich to heart and God was mother? Where is the feminine? And to my surprise, I realized that, I, that the issues I intellectually saw around the Virgin Mary across history with issues of virgin conception and birth, which is impossible for any ordinary woman, perfect mother, perfect relating, and well protected from dangerous sexuality, these things were in my internal world as well. And if I was going to move forward personally and have any voice worth contributing, I'd have to look at the Virgin Mary and ask what she is for me and spirituality today. When I was younger, I explored different traditions. So many of my friends were looking into Buddhism and mysticism and New Age to find meaning. But I realized that I couldn't avoid my own tradition because it was ingrained into me. So I studied hard and found a Judeo-Christian history and tradition full of gifts that somehow I didn't feel were being passed on. Extraordinary ritual, poetry, theology, art, music, and more. I knew a spiritual path is often difficult, as is life. But when I looked at the possibility of ordination, I knew it would be challenging. I was, I, was, I was only on the second wave of women. Jane was on the first wave here. And we, were no, we still were not allowed women bishops. It was going to be a church that was exempt from the Sexual Discrimination Act of 67. I was going to potentially be in a room full of men who could look at me with disdain, ask me to leave. But what I didn't realize was that standing in my ancestral line to take on the gifts and the battles, I'd find that the history of cultural oppression had marked me in such a way that it was within me as well as outside. And the extraordinary questions we're having at the moment have such potential for new understanding. We're looking at religion at a time when we're questioning gender and femininity in both men and women. We're facing the reality of a culture that has covered up abuse and a disrespect for sexual boundaries. We need a better understanding of religious symbolism and language for interfaith relations for local and international levels especially for religious women who, to learn from them and support them. When I first worked with Amra Bowen, the first woman on the Muslim Sharia Law Council in the UK, we talked about Mary. It was our first conversation. She is a respected woman in the Quran. And we also talked about Fatima, one of Muhammad's daughters, much loved. And then we started talking about it was to live the life, the devotional life as a woman, Without this, we would not have been able to build a deep conversation and find the beginning of trust. And away from religion, we now have a strong secular and secular Christian culture. Many people say they're spiritual but not religious, understandable when we see the history of corruption and destruction done in the name of religion. However, I've been asking myself, if we agree that religion is corrupt, then are we colluding with the authority that corrupted it? Is it not more powerful for all of us to reclaim our tradition and its gifts, to say, no, this is what religion should be, and this is the tradition of our ancestors that we want to pass on? So today, I'd like to talk to you about gender, 
sexuality, parenthood, elderhood, and spirituality all through the image of Mary. A woman that at this time of year is still somewhat invisible in plain sight in the many nativity plays, riding on a donkey or sitting in a stable. I'd like us to consider her as a woman pregnant with the divine, a woman pregnant with God, and ask how her image and our understanding of our understanding of years of oppression and powerful liberation can contribute to a modern debate. But how did Mary, about whom so little is said in the Gospels, become such a complex and powerful global figure? Because in the four Gospels there are hardly any mentions of her, and some of these are contradictory. She's mentioned as mother in birth narrative, receives a message from the angel Gabriel, goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. She takes her son to the temple only 40 days after giving birth, is at the wedding at Cana, attends her son's teaching once, is seen at the foot of the cross, and later, after the resurrection, is with the disciples at the outpouring of the Spirit. But these are only very brief mentions. If you think of the large proportion of stories in the New, Pe in the New Testament, these small mentions are really tiny. Really, when we look at Mary, we're looking at a woman who, like most, has been invisible, going unrecorded in our history. But unlike most women, people have tried to write her history for the last 2,000 years. The first stories of Mary are within Jewish culture, giving her through Joseph an ancestral line back to David and linking her to women like Rahab and Ruth from the Hebrew Bible. In Rome, there's a second century catacomb for St. Priscilla with a painting of Mary on the wall as a woman looking down lovingly at her babe in arms with the prophet Isaiah by her side, a strong Hebrew tradition that we're often disconnected from, a Jewish woman with a Jewish line. The early Christians believed all were equal, slave and master, male and female, in the words of St. Paul. Women held services and they taught. And theology began influenced by Greek mythology and philosophy. And as early as 180, the Greek theologian Irenaeus, who is from what we now know as Turkey, already writes of Mary as the second Eve with a non-linear understanding of history. He ties past and present together for a circular redemption. The original Eve though coupled with Adam, was a virgin in paradise who disobeyed God and brought sin. Mary is a virgin on earth who obeys God and brings redemption. And there's a parallel to the original tree of life. Adam disobeys God by eating an apple. Christ, who is the second Adam, obeys God in the tree of the cross. So Christ is really human, and by walking through each stage of life, he redeems it back to paradise. But a Mary's obedient human life is also redempted. So now she's become more than a woman and more than a prophet. She is powerfully involved in the very center of creation and salvation. And soon, poetic prayers are written to her, devotional prayers. The oldest one is found in 250 on a papyrus from Egypt. A translation would be, it was in Old Greek, but a translation would be, Under your mercy, we take refuge, Mother of God. Our prayers do not despise, nor our necessities, but from danger deliver us. Only pure, only blessed. You'd be forgiven to think that Mary was divine. The theologians such as Tertullian and Oregon follow Irenaeus discussing, discussing Mary as mother of God. And though agreeing on her virgin, the conception, the virginity of her conception of Jesus, there's a debate about whether she even remains a virgin during and after birth. By 312, with the conversion of Emperor Constantine, 
and then 380 when Emperor Theodosius decreed Christianity as the official religion of Rome. Councils had convened to agree a theology of the divine Jesus, the first doctrine, if you like, and in discussing him, they had to look at his mother. And they mostly agreed in a perpetual virginity that she was a virgin in birth and after birth. And people talked about perhaps that the rest of her children were originally Joseph's children and not hers at all, or that she just remained a virgin somehow, mysteriously, mystically. And although these councils were trying to avoid Mary being seen as divine, this affirmation of a doctrinal title gave rise to paintings and icons of her sitting majestic on a throne, now looking out to the Christians who prayed for her to help as royal mother of God. 